This episode of Healthy Home Hacks is sponsored by the Building Biology Institute. To learn more about creating indoor environments that support health and wellness, visit their free resources at buildingbiologyinstitute.org. How would you like to improve your health and keep your family safe? You're listening to the Healthy Home Hacks podcast, where we firmly believe enjoying optimal health shouldn't be a luxury. Healthy Home Authorities and husband and wife team, Ron and Lisa, will help you create a home environment that will level up your health. It's time to hear from the experts. Listen in on honest conversations and gain the best tips and advice. If you're ready to dive in and improve your well being and increase your energy, you're in the right place. All right, here are your hosts bow biologists, authors, media darlings, vicarious vegans, and avocado aficionados. Ron and Lisa Barris. Picture this. I'm sitting anxiously perched on the exam room table, trying desperately to tame the sounds of the crinkling parchment paper. My physician, for privacy's sake, let's just call her Dr. M. She's cloaked in a pristine white lab coat, and she gazed across at me, firmly grasping her clipboard in both hands. Your blood test came back normal. Everything is fine except that it wasn't. While those words normally would be music to any woman's ears during a doctor's visit, today was a different story. The music was more melancholy and less harmonious. Knowing something is physically wrong with you and hearing that there's no explanation and no solution for your symptoms is a hard pill to swallow. The hope, the disappointments, the time, the energy, the money, the travel, and the heart-wrenching desire to get my life back hit me the hardest at that moment. I couldn't hold back my emotions anymore. I started crying in the office. You seem sad, she consoled. If it would help, I can write you a prescription for antidepressants. Wait, what? Antidepressants? Dr. M, I'm not clinically depressed. I'm PO'd. I'm tired. I'm drained. I'm at another dead end. Please explain how the numbing of my emotions will help. Clinical depression, which I have no diagnosis for aside, helped me understand when shedding tears became an illness and showing sadness became shameful. There I was feeling beaten down. And just because I exhibited a shred of emotion, the doctor with a sleight of hand was scribbling out a solution to not cure my illness or even eliminate my symptoms, but rather to send me to the kingdom of numb. Rather than spend the time to deal with the underlying issues, she prescribed a way for my emotions to vanish quickly. So I declined the antidepressant blue light special, grabbed my bag and proceeded to the parking lot, vowing to take back my power. In the days and weeks that followed the doctor's appointment, I began asking, seeking and knocking. I researched with an unflagging resolve and made one small change to my lifestyle after another. What followed suit knocked my toxic socks off. In less than a year, my health did a 180 degree turnaround. And today we have a doctor with us who understands the power of getting to the root of illness firsthand. Dr. Naj graduated magna cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania and then from Cornell Medical College. After emergency medicine residency in New York City, she practiced in Los Angeles until becoming severely ill as a result of complex medical condition known as chemical sensitivity or environmental illness. Dr. Naj is the vice chairman of the Integrative Medicine Consortium. She's a member and the communications liaison for the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, She's the president of Educational Nonprofit Preventative and Environmental Health Alliance and a member of the NIH Roundtable on Building and Health and the CDC National Conversation on Chemicals and Health. Welcome to the show, Dr. Nas. It's great to uh, be here. And I got to say, when you read that little vignette about the female patient who was in the doctor's office. Me. That was me. (laughs) That was me. I went... Yeah, I went to a neurologist with my hopes up that he would figure out what was wrong with me. And I ended up getting so angry and crying and I wouldn't leave the office without some sort of a clue to diagnosis. I became relatively hysterical because I was on death's door and I couldn't cope with a doctor who just wanted to walk away because it was too overwhelming. And doctors aren't paid enough 
to do a two or three hour appointment. Mm -hmm. In that first appointment, you need a lot of time to do an environmental history. Mm. And if the doctor was paid, you know, $1,100, let's say, then they would be happy to keep mm. talking to the patient, if that makes sense. That makes but total sense. Right? They need to get you out of the office. And the easiest way is to think of a solution that would make the patient feel better, right. quick and easy, and it's going to be a prescription because they don't have any idea what's going on. It's too confusing, too upsetting, and they're not being reimbursed to think about it or go even read about it. Mm -hmm. So, Gosh, Dr. Naj, thank you for sharing that. I mean, that was my story, and um, it gets obviously a lot deeper than that. Uh, you know, 12 doctors was... She was one of the last doctors out of 12 doctors that I saw, everything from acupuncturists and naturopaths to endocrinologists and acupuncturists and energy healers. I went to everybody. I wish I knew you back then. Um, but it's so interesting to hear your perspective. As a doctor yourself, you felt like that. Well, there's something else I could comment because I'm a little bit in people's face sometimes. And when I stood up at the ILADS meeting years ago, because I see it from the patient point of view first, I think, because I was sick and I was dying and nobody really knew and nobody really cares about you but yourself. You know, it's very hard to get well when um, you're a doctor, you have the opportunity to do research and figure it out more so than a lay person. But then I didn't know about integrative medicine at all. So part of it was bad for me because I had to learn. I didn't even know about acupuncture. So I was doing all these therapies and, and seeking help, but it really, I was the slowest person in the world. But I did say this at the ILADS meeting, um, maybe to the shock and abhorrence of the audience who is all physicians, you know, who are physicians. It's about money. You know, life is about money. So doctors want to make money. In fact, my colleagues from Cornell, uh, when I talk to them and they're gynecologists or whatever, you know, they're practicing and they're so excited when they have something that they can offer patients that makes them money, not mm -hmm. their breakthrough. Wow. So there are academic mm -hmm. friends of mine or acquaintances of mine from med school who don't make much money or they do research or they're just good eggs and they're nerdy and they don't make much money. Mm. And then there are regular doctors who are very excited when they make a lot of money. Wow. So they want to make half a million dollars. It's a dollars business, either. right? It's a business. I mean, I think oh, years ago we watched that movie, the business of being born. I don't know if you ever saw that documentary talking all about the money kind of industry of having babies and, and also what C-sections, like how they really push C-sections for, right. you know, so would you say like the doctors that don't accept insurance? Because we we see that a lot in like integrative and functional MDs, like they just don't, they don't accept insurance. And that's for that very reason that you're talking about. Yeah. So a cash patient means that the doctor can take the time that they want to have a nice long appointment for well, most people do an hour. I tend to leave four hours and I do most appointments for about three because I'm doing history, physical. And then a break, explaining the testing they're going to do the next day with saliva, collecting 24-hour urine, and uh, what they're doing at the laboratory the next morning. So there's a lot of chit-chat about like those, what they call housekeeping, you know, like mm -hmm. the basics. And you don't want to be rushed. They're already stressed enough. They can't remember anything. So it's typed out, you know, what to do. And then I feel that the integrative physician got excited over the last decade or two that they can make so much money because mm -hmm. these people are so sick. Mm -hmm. So I, my push is that environmental medicine is more in depth in their approach than integrative medicine. It's, it's a step oh. further. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay. So environmental considers things that integrative doesn't, and both of them should utilize things like uh, assessing the hormones and doing hormone management or anti-aging, which I think is a bad name, but environmental medicine are the old altruistic doctors. They're allergists. Mm -hmm. They've learned to do hormone management. They do an allergy testing method called provocation and neutralization, mm -hmm. which nobody else does except for some ear, nose, and throat doctors. Wow. Mm. So that's the crux of environmental medicine is mm. P and N allergy, P and N allergy testing. And I used to say nobody gets well without the shots. So right. it could be emphatic when a patient would call me. I, I helped about 6,000 people before I worked because I was just sick recovering yeah. and I would guide people to go find a physician elsewhere. Mm. And in through the Academy of Environmental Medicine, I learned about all the other doctors and I visited them all and knew who did what. And then I would help people to go find help. And I used to say, nobody gets well without the shots. And I said it today to somebody who's got mercury issues and pain mm -hmm. syndrome and they're doing chelation, but yet neutralization, allergy testing and treatment for mercury. Maybe the key to somebody who has a mercury problem because they can't get it all out. 
Right. A lot of it's stuck in the tissues in the brain. So if you don't understand the treatments that are different from a particular branch of medicine, then you don't know to go. And so I'm, you know, getting that out at the beginning is that Mm. environmental physicians look to the causes in more depth, but also the treatments are a bit different. And some Mm. treatments are not available. Like I don't do every single treatment known to man, but if you want to go to Germany and do something, or you want to go to Mm. California and do something that I don't do, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And I can share the patient. And I'm going back to what I said at ILADS. The doctor needs to share the patient. Mm -hmm. It's not like the patient comes to you and it's a money mill. Yeah, And everybody right. wants to protect their income mm. and not let that patient be on their journey to the next physician. And they will see the original physician for what they do. Wow. Okay. So that's a big concept of sharing yeah. the patient and, and not trying to hoard them all. So that if you're an environmental physician and your patient was too sick, they all went to Dr. Ray. Yeah. Mm. Right. Everybody knew. Do you know Dr. Ray? Yes. Oh, yeah. For those of you um, who don't know that are listening, Dr. Ray is an environmental. Well, what he he passed away a few years ago, but he yeah. he ran the largest um, environmental health center in Dallas. Right. Was I think that was what it was yeah. what it was called the environmental health center, and yeah, it was world renowned because no one was really doing anything like that. So, you know, I have the environmental health center of Martha's Vineyard named after. Mm. you know, Bill Ray's practice and with his permission and it's still there. And my friends are running it. Um, There are two physicians who do a great job and we have slightly different approaches. They have Dallas pollution and I have Martha's Vineyard ocean air. So Mm. patients do get very well here because half of their treatment could be just outdoor air and going to the ocean. Wow. Mm. The ocean. So you still operate at that facility or no? I mean, uh, on Martha's Vineyard? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. You said two other people ran it. I wasn't sure if you... No, the Dallas clinic. Oh, gotcha. So okay. Dr. Ray passed away mm-hmm. and his clinic in Dallas is, mm-hmm. is run by two physicians who are very competent and we all have different angles and different experience. My feeling is that if you didn't get really sick, you may not know as much as you need to know in yeah. terms of how to get well. Mm-hmm. So because I was sick myself, a lot of people figure, well, if I got better, I may know something about getting yeah. better, you know, that's true. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, and so a lot of integrative doctors, they got on the bandwagon with fish oil and B12, but they didn't think they were really ill themselves. So they're giving treatments, but not necessarily understanding the crux. So I'll mm-hmm. get excited because there's no point in being boring. The crux <laughs> of environmental medicine you know, I mean, it's exciting getting better, right? And if yeah. I can impart the excitement to you, then it's going to, somebody will remember it. Yeah. You can get better, but you need to, this man I was talking to today, you need to get off your duff and travel. It's not going to be in your town. Oh uh, yeah. You need to go to the specialist who, right. who deals with this. When you were talking about the shots, can you explain what you meant by that? It's in yeah, the shot. So the, and I have a bad memory sometimes. So I'm going to repeat, uh, finish my last sentence. The main thing you do is daily treatment when you go. And you stay for weeks or months. Okay. So it could be By a- shots, do you mean uh, like IV treatment? IV no, no, therapy? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to get to okay. it. Okay. So if you go somewhere for treatment, you can do two days where you get your history and physical, you get an adrenal assessment with an ACTH stimulation test on day two, maybe do IV vitamin C, and you can get all the blood work going, and then you can get urine and saliva. If you stay for a week or two, you get to the point of doing neutralization and provocation allergy testing. The first two are skin tests for histamine and skin tests for serotonin. Each test takes 30 to 60 minutes just for histamine. Mm. So you inject a little histamine and it makes a wheel that's seven millimeter size, a little raise in the skin. It's called intradermal. Mm. Then you go and do 10 minutes later, you look at the wheel and if it's grown to a nine millimeter wheel, that's called positive. And then you can go to a more dilute solution and you keep going down in dilution from six, seven, eight, nine, until you get no wheel growth. It stays seven millimeters. Mm. And then all the other wheels may shrink, which mm-hmm. is the effect of the last wheel on the others. And the person who feels like cloud may have lifted. Ooh, they wow. feel good. So I had neutralization for everything, you know, histamine, serotonin, the molds, the pollens, the cat dander, the feathers. <laughs> you know, 10 or 15 chemicals. But when they did formaldehyde skin testing Ooh, on me, right. the cloud lifted. Oh I looked gosh. at the magazines. At the at, There was a magazine rack in the room, not in Dallas, but in another doctor's. And all of a sudden, 
I could tell the magazines no longer bothered me because it must have been a chemical like a formaldehyde mm -hmm. in the magazines. And I could just look at them and tell the wow. smell of the magazine was lifted. It's yeah. also benzene, you know, in ink and there are other right. things. That, but I just knew that was the one that was going to help me. Now, is that this wheel? I've never had that done. I had the yeah. prick the prick on the back. Is that old school when they pricked old your school. back? Yeah. That's old, old school. school. They don't do that anymore? They do, but that's traditional allergy. Okay. That's gotcha. it's called RAST. Test. It, you know, so the, the testing for scratch, RAST, these are terminologies that are used in allergy practices where the quad AI, the allergy group, doesn't like the environmental medicine group. They thought <laughs> uh, in the 1950s, I believe, about turf. And then when the test IgE came out, which is like traditional allergy hives and the skin testing would be positive if you have IgE and then the blood testing would be positive if you have IgE reaction, you could have anaphylaxis. And that's related to histamine released and mast cell disorder and it's all tied in. In traditional medicine, they believe that. But if you talk about IgG testing in the blood for you eat too much beef and so you have an elevated IgG for beef. If you skin test the way I'm talking for neutralization and provocation, we don't know how it works. It freaks out allergists and they don't like the turf battle for the money. Oh, they, gotcha. Right? Wow. So if they had an allergy practice where they made money on provocation and neutralization or sublingual, which is now accepted, then they would like it because they're mm, making money. I see. So my, my, I'm going to interrupt one sec. Um, my idea was to go to Medicare and say, if you covered PNN, young doctors would go into the field of environmental medicine mm -hmm. because they can make a living and right. it would be covered by insurance. And then it would open up the field for those that are disabled or elderly who have Medicare and then you know other insurances would follow. But Blue Cross specifically won't cover provocation and neutralization. They have a whole paragraph on their website. Wow. They don't cover intravenous vitamins. They won't pay for phosphatidylcholine. They list these things. They know environmental medicine does it. Mm -hmm. So if you don't get down to the specifics when you mm -hmm. and I talk, it's not as interesting because these things that you may have skipped or some other patient may have skipped, people don't even know unless you, you know, if it's at the end of the lecture, who's going to yeah. remember? Right. Wow. Gosh. So does, did Medicare, Medicaid, did they agree to cover it? No, I mean, I just talked superficially when I was in Congress. I was there speaking at the uh, Veterans Health Subcommittee, and I did get them through uh, a specialist at Stanford named Wesley Ashford. They were uh, pr appropriating $100 million for veterans toxic exposure research right after I presented. So I was there for that reason, and you walk the halls of Congress and do what you can, but I need support from like Liz Warren or somebody who actually Liz is great. I met with her in the hallway mm -hmm. and I walked up to her and I said, I'm Dr. Naj. We met on Martha's Vineyard and took a picture. A bunch of my patients, you know, chatted with you and said, listen to Lisa. And then I don't know, do you have a few minutes to talk? And she talked to me for 30 minutes in the hallway. And my father was funny. He reminded me that's what a lobbyist does. <laughs> wait in the lobby. It's another hat you have. Oh, that's funny. That's where Isn't the that name funny? came from. Yeah, that is funny. Yeah. I never knew that. So I was like the environmental medicine lobbyist, but I never realized it's because you're. That's where you get people. It's yeah, the, the senators are walking to get them the on the way to their office. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, so I need support from people like that, and mm -hmm. then Corona kind of gets in the way. So, you know, later we can talk about the interface between environmental medicine and Corona and the immune system, but go ahead. Do you have something else we should talk about? Yeah, I want to, I want to get back to coronavirus, but let's start off with mold. Cause I know that you, I happen to know a little bit about your background and that you had mold toxicity in a home, you had mold exposure and tell me a little bit more about that and what happened. Was your whole family sick? You know, how did, how did you find it? And what did you do? Well, I didn't find any mold when I was there. We had an aquarium shed built around a Walt Disney 5,000 gallon aquarium with tanks and koi fish and a doctor had built it. And unfortunately the doctor became impaired who sold me the house. He was kind of crazy, agitated, kind of disorganized. So I bought this great house with this big fish tank in the living room wall and a shed uh, you would walk around back and it smelled like an aquarium shed, but mm -hmm. it turns out he covered up the air intake for the house with a shed. So the air intake <gasps> came from the aquarium shed. Oh, wow. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Ugh. So it, it didn't smell bad in my house, but basically the spores that were created on the pine wood box of the shed 
came into the house and then right. the house was contaminated, but I never knew. I sold the house weak, looking like I had a Lou Gehrig's picture. I had adrenal insufficiency, which is called Addison's disease. And I had weak muscles, couldn't chew, swallow. I was very confused. In fact, the medical society came to visit me and I said, I can't really pay my mortgage. It's like 3,500 a month. And I'm, I'm sure there's somebody else that needs the money more than me. And they, they wrote me a check for $10,000. You're kidding. No, they That's donated like, oh 10 grand gosh, to me because I looked nice. so bad. I was just wow. there in my bathrobe in the middle yeah. of the day. The heat was wiping me out. I didn't know what was wrong. And they thought I was sick, even though I thought, oh, I must be depressed. So I was on the You thought it was just death. depression? So like, what, what was your first, it sounds like adrenal burnout. What was your first mm-hmm. symptom or kind of like something is just not right? I'm going downhill here. Well, I was working in the emergency room. I'm an ER doc. And I couldn't push the heavy ultrasound machine. And when I would take the probe and put it on the belly to look at the gallbladder, my arm would get tired. Wow. And then I couldn't even bend down if I was examining the patient. We do rectal exams. And I was so tired. I couldn't even put my arm in the right position and bend to get in that spot to do a rectal exam when somebody was on their side. I mean, I was so fried at work. Um, And I didn't recognize as a doctor that that was abnormal, you know, like, right. You just just, thought maybe you're working long hours, probably. I don't know when it, when it creeps up on you slowly over decades. Yeah. So I was hypoadrenal and skinny and tan as a child Mm -hmm. and I was not a runner and I was, you know, I like to ride horses and ski. I do things that give me speed without having, making me do the exercise. Mm -hmm. There you go. I ride horses. I jump. (laughs) Right. But I yeah. don't run and do the jumping. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I didn't realize I was a mopey child and I loved candy <laughs> and I was a whiner, you know, like a little, I, I just was a little bit like, what am I going to You sound do? lovely. You sound lovely. <laughs> How am I going to, what clothes should I wear? You know, I couldn't decide anything. I was just, and it's amazing. Yeah. I was going to become a general surgeon. I did two years of trauma. Wow. And then I was operating for 14 hours and fainting and, you know, I didn't. So are under- you saying some of that started for you as yeah. a child? Okay. Yeah. So this, what is that? Adrenal burnout as a child? Well, what? the burnout term, I try to stay away from some buzzwords like detox. Okay. You know, I use the word detoxification. Adrenal burnout. Yeah. I mean, I was born thin and thin people have thin adrenals. Okay. So you or anybody else who's thin, we've got thin adrenals. Obese people often have big plump adrenals. Do you know what? Got- I have noticed that because I will see, you know, heavy set people in like really labor intensive jobs thinking, dang, they, they just have so much energy. And yeah, but they're I look at them and think they're a lot more. They're happy. They've got pudgy cheeks, you know, yeah. like Santa Claus. Ho, ho, yeah. ho. Yeah. yeah. Santa Claus and you'd think going, they'd be the tired oh, ones, but yeah, that's so interesting. That explains yeah. that. Um, and I have seen obese people with low adrenal function, but nevertheless, I'll be quick. Over your lifetime, you have multiple exposures and then they add up until you become so sick that you have to go find out why you can't, you have pain or disability. So when I was a kid, I had bloody noses at the age of three and four, and that was mold exposure in Cleveland. Mm. And they had a stocky botrys outbreak and all these kids had hemorrhagic mm-hmm a pulmonary disease. It was published by the CDC and then retracted. So there may be a stocky botrys problem in Cleveland with heating systems. I don't know, but I was mm-hmm. definitely suffering. My, my mom was crying and my dad was belligerent. And so those mm-hmm. are the things that happen. Men usually become angry mm-hmm. around a moldy home, living in a moldy home and belligerent and then they lose their memory all the so, all the wives are going to be blaming their <laughs> blaming this yeah. on mold now <laughs> we have mold. their husbands no, no but i wrote an article called mold and marital discord in yes. LA yoga i actually remember that article I, and because people about that and they were like wow what i mean you'd never really associate that with mold you, there's the typical like hay fever like symptoms and all of that but you don't think of like an emotional side of it oh it's um, totally. anger and things yeah Yep. So I, you know, I don't want to speak at the same time you are, but there's a Brown study that's by Shanessa that showed there's a 40% rate of depression if you live in a house with a mold problem. So it's very mm-hmm. closely associated with being sad. Mm-hmm. Men get really angry and then they can be completely unreasonable. They love red wine. They mm. become addicted to red wine when they're a mold. A, a mold okay, we do, we do not have mold in our house then because we're white wine drinkers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so much better. I feel better. <laughs> but, you know, it's a pattern and not everybody is the same. And in, in personal situation, um, my memory went, you know, I couldn't read for three years. 
I couldn't remember names very well. And now I'm pretty sharp, but I never had a good memory for names from birth. You know, so, uh, you know, when I was a, a little kid, I couldn't remember names or street names. So we all have issues that are part genetic, part environmental. And then when I moved into the house that had this more significant mold problem, on departure, I can now tell that that house made my husband sick, made myself sick, gave him autoimmune disease, gave him memory loss, gave him mm. Parkinson's symptoms. We left the house, the cogwheeling and Parkinson's symptoms went away. Wow. But you can't, you know, it doesn't last forever, right? Sometimes mm. people will get sick. So I don't know about giving people advice when they're in a moldy environment, other than to say, not everybody has the drive to get well. And yeah. the, women, the women are good at it. Women they'll save good. the kids. Mm -hmm. They'll flee the home. They'll get new mm -hmm. clothes. They'll get a new car. They'll definitely you know. get new clothes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's and, the you know, that's top priority. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's sad because the children will often be food allergic and mm -hmm. they'll get tachycardia and anxiety. And I've now tied it into addiction. So I really like to talk about that at the end. And if I could talk about one sad mold case that's only like three sentences, you know, there's uh, Robert F. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. is a an environmental lawyer and he did a book and a movie about the moldy mansion that they redid so robert they, f kennedy jr yeah. or yes okay yeah. oh. and i think they have six children and yeah, his, they wife, do. his wife was mary and what they did was they put the house on stilts and they gutted the first floor and removed it and rebuilt it and then they did a book and a movie and um they talk about the mold in the house mm. in the book Wow. And Rose Styron, you know, had had the book and I, I got it from her and read it. She's a prominent person who's a friend of the Clintons on the vineyard. That is a good friend of my family. And so I said, oh, this is, you know, what Mary was suffering from is and the children was mold exposure and how it affected them. And then Mary uh, had, I guess, some drinking issue and some emotional issue and was a very nice person. And mm. uh, she hung herself. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. Right. And, and it was so bizarre. Her, yeah, mm -hmm. she hung herself the night that I was writing a speech for the medical society. Wow. And the time is now, women will die. This is what I was writing. Wow. And then her death came across the television at three in the morning because I always write Ugh. late. Wow. So my mission is you know, quite important, I feel, that people who do not have uh, the wherewithal to go to an environmental doctor and get well, they do not see death coming. They do not see their addiction to you know, alcohol and drugs as related to their environmental exposure so right. it's fun it's really fun to fix people because you know i'm dating somebody and that person quit drinking within five days of fixing the adrenal gland of replacing oh, wow. hormones yeah 40 he's years like now this is a girlfriend i'm sticking with her yeah. <laughs> <You see>? uh, <laughs> yeah even suzanne summers ron and i know her and her husband they had mold issue i don't know if you remember that was oh, yeah um, yeah and in their home, I believe it was their Malibu home, major mold issue. And as we know, as building biologists, and as you know, mold, you can have mold, you can have mold infiltrating your home and not even see it. As if it's behind walls and under floors right. and behind cabinets, you can see just maybe a little bit of moisture. So, and well, just, the thing is, I think Suzanne Summers, you know, has some experience with a relative and knows Dr. Ray and wrote five pages in her book about Dr. Ray. But still, you don't go down to Dallas for a short period of time and get well. Mm -hmm. So that dabbling in environmental medicine, I tried to reach out and get her to give me a call so you can let her know I'm here. Dr. Naj, I want to interrupt you because we yeah. have a caller. Um, she's been holding for a little bit and she has, her name is Annette and she has a question for you. Annette um, can tell you more about it, but she had mold exposure in a home that her parents were living in as well as mold toxicity. So she has some questions for you. Hi. Hi, Annette. How old are you? I'm 43. Okay, tell me your story. Uh, well, uh, I was caretaking for my parents over an 18-month period of time, and I was living as well as cleaning out a fully finished basement of a house. And it turns out that there was mold um, in the house, and I have a very high mold exposure and some pretty serious side effects from the exposure to the mold. I have a CNS disorder that's developed from exposure to the mold called dystonia. It's appearing most as a cervical dystonia. I saw somebody else who had a severe dystonia from mold and then had a implanted device. Do you have one of those devices? Does that help? 
I have not gone to the device yet. That would be a final step for me. I'm working right now on just some um, cognitive remapping therapy, and it seems to be actually doing well. And the question I have for you, I've also gone on a mold protocol, and just two weeks on this three-month protocol, I'm already feeling better. But what I've observed is with all of the different environmental specialists, there seems to be a wide range of protocols applied to remove mold spores from the body. Is there a best standard, a gold standard, or how do I decipher what's the appropriate protocol? Well, okay, here are my cynical comments. One, you're going to be perimenopausal, so think hormones. Two, uh, living in the basement is always a bad idea, and if it smelled musty, always turn around and leave before you plant your flag and live somewhere you know for the future there's so many moldy buildings right it's hard to find one that isn't moldy in certain locations in the country the protocol word i never use it, to me it's always somebody who's trying to sound fancy like they're a famous practitioner and want to name a protocol after themselves i think i should probably figure out how to name something after myself but we don't really have protocols in environmental medicine you approach each patient and find out what you want to do first you got 10 treatments or 15 things you can do, and you want to prioritize what the patient's issue is. So you, you can't have the same treatment plan for everybody because if you've got dystonia and somebody else has suicidality and somebody else has a heart rate of 150, everybody's going to have a different first day or first treatment day. And you're not really dealing so much with spores in the body. So people feel like, you know, they can tell how many spores are in their body or how many spores they're getting exposed to. But you may have mold growing in your sinuses or your lungs or, you know, your GI tract or yeast, but you may not. You may just have toxins. And those toxins are chemicals and mold toxins called mycotoxins. And they can be measured at three labs, real-time labs, Vibrant America, and Great Plains. And depends on which insurance, you know, if you have insurance or not. But Vibrant really has a good panel that's cheap. And um, when you see a physician, you don't really want to see a physician who says they have a mold protocol. <laughs> it's like a buzzword for not doing the right thing. So it's not just about cholestyramine and binders, but that may help people. But it's the main thing is getting out of your moldy clothes and making sure you don't have any furniture or the car anymore that started the problem. Do you have any possessions that got exposed to mold? No. I mean, I, we're, we're out of the house. Any clothes that I was wearing during that time have gone in the garbage, and the car um, associated with the house is no longer in the family. So all Excellent. possessions or anything that could be carrying a spore has been disposed of. Good. Okay, because they're filled with this chemical stuff. So there could be 15 different toxins and chemicals and spores in your stuff, and they may have an odor. Can you smell the paper? From your old days, does it have an odor? I'm sorry, I have nothing associated with that time or, or that house. Okay. So yeah, all of that's been discarded. But you're right, there was absolutely, as I was going through, you know, old boxes of clothes or things um, that my parents had stored, there was definitely a distinct smell to it, for sure. Oh, good. Okay, so the smell is helpful because then if you, you know, if you can use your nose to identify something that's not good, then it means you have a good sense of smell too. So have you seen an environmental physician that's board certified by the American Academy of Environmental Medicine is question number one. I have, and, you know, I apologize for using the word protocol. I see how that definitely triggered the no, discussion. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, actually I did, I did quite a bit of testing over the last, couple months through real time and as well great planes and really identified all the different aspects of my body that have been affected by the mold so there absolutely great. is a dysregulation in my gi tract with the bacteria there is yeast present there are toxins present there's neurological damage and it's interesting because the it, i guess the the question i had is when i talked to the board certified environmental toxin specialist they all have a different approach of how they want to tackle all the systems that are dysregulated. And I guess that's, that's where I kind of shrug and say, oh my gosh, I'm a scientist, but I don't know who has the right approach. They're absolutely all personalized and it took um, months to pull together all the data to understand the whole situation. What's, what's your background? Right now. What's, I'm an immunologist. Immunologist? Yes. Okay. So yeah, you're going to know more than they do. So have you seen, though, uh, not somebody who's board certified in tox, 
but environmental medicine, not occupational and environmental at a hospital, those people do not like these cases. <laughs> you want to see somebody from AAEM. H have you seen somebody from that group? Yes, I'm, I'm working with somebody out of the Santa Monica homeopathic pharmacy who is specifically focused on environmental toxins. But is it a doctor? Yes, I've talked to the right people. And I think you've answered my question well. It's that this is a very personalized approach and difficult to tackle, right? So I didn't mean to be harsh, but I'm just trying to be specific to, you know, maybe find things that you haven't done that you can look forward to doing if you're not well. So, yeah, that would be great. I would love I'm to I'm just very that. concrete. Yeah, because otherwise it's, you know, too ephemeral. So the idea is you want to make sure you go to a place and get treated every day. So before you got on, I don't know if you know what I know about getting well, because I got sick and I went to Dallas for three months and I got better. It took about six years. And then I was able to work 10, 10 years after I went. So I lost 10 years oh. of my life you know, $3 million in income. And, you know, I almost died from like a Lou Gehrig's picture and mitochondrial damage and neurologic disease. And I got better. So it's totally possible. But as a physician, I knew what I needed to do. Once I found a place that knew what was wrong with me, I kind of dove in. So you need to find that place for you. Dr. Naj got sick from mold exposure, which I don't think that you heard, Annette. We were talking about that at the top of the show. I'm not sure if you heard that. Um, even as a physician, she got sick and went to the Environmental Health Center in Dallas, which was owned by Dr. William Ray, who passed away. And if you want to tell her about your clinic, Dr. Naj. Well, I have a place where I treat people similar to Dr. Ray, but I feel I add a few things that are useful. And I was saying before that luckily I got well because I'm on an island. There no, there's no diesel exhaust and I was intolerant of pollution. So I had to leave Los Angeles forever because of ozone. I couldn't do ozone. I couldn't be, I was in a respirator when I left LA. So I had a heart rate of 140 when I was near ozone. So you need to figure out where you're going to get treated and where you're going to live. And what I usually say is that you're going to go somewhere, pay rent in one place, you know, don't pay rent at home and then go somewhere for months for treatment. Don't, don't get a new house yet. You don't know what you need. So this is to a new patient, you know, who I'd be talking to on the phone and doing a phone appointment. And then I tell them, you know, you can go to a hotel, get clean clothes. After four days, you're going to unmask and you're going to use no chemical products, nothing with scent, no perfume. And you're going to eat organic on a four day rotation, not having chicken more than once every four days and everything else rotate it all. So if these principles have been taught to you, then fine. If they haven't, then, then you're learning what you need to do. Then you need a charcoal mask and you need a respirator. If you unmask and become sensitive to chemicals, what are you going to do? Are you Are going to go running out in the street complaining? Oh my God, my apartment smells like carpet. No, you're going to put your mask on and figure out how to hunker down in a clean oasis bedroom with a charcoal air filter that you've already pre-purchased for $350, nothing fancy, and you're going to get well in your clean environment, avoiding chemicals and not eating pesticide food. You've got to lower your total load. And the other thing to do is order Mountain Valley water in five gallons. Have you done any of those four things? Yes. So the only thing what? I've not done is found myself the treatment center. So I have sold everything I own, my house, my boat, my cars, my clothes, everything gone put myself into a clean environment. I'm in a temporary housing on the beach in Florida as Good. far away from everything as I could find. I am in a rental, but I was very strict when I moved here. There are special HEPA air filters. I have charcoal filters all over, wear a mask, all of that. I put nothing on my body. I'm eating completely clean. I'm on a fob mob diet, something like that. So, but what I have not done is this final step of going in person for a few months to a treatment center. I'd and love you may to just, that. You may, you may just need, so you've done a good job and you've learned some stuff that's perfect. I, the two books I recommend are Living with, a, Living with Environmental Illness by Stephen Edelson and Stevens with a PH. And the first chapter tells you all the principles of environmental medicine. You may pick up some pointers. And the Oasis Bedroom is on page 162. Nobody told me about the Oasis Bedroom. I learned about it years later. So it's kind of slow. 
You want no carpet in your Oasis bedroom, hard floor, preferably not wood, and definitely not a polyurethane that has oil base. So you <laughs> right. usually, yeah. So you yeah. usually want, you know, tile or marble. And then the charcoal air filter I recommend is Ariox. And then there's Austin Air. And then there's a new one I've been using. IQ Air is excellent too. Yeah, but they're IQ big. Air. You know, the Aerox is small mm -hmm. and is very quiet for the bedroom. And then you can use mm -hmm. the bigger ones, you know, in the living room and upstairs and downstairs. You can have bigger ones all around. And then there's a EnviroCleanse. is mineral-based, but it works really well. So mm -hmm. I have one of those and they're like 650 and they work, clean up like the smell of terpenes or wood mm -hmm. in a very large treatment room I have that has a little bit of wood and it just makes everything evaporate. So that's good. But the, the okay. rotational diet was uh, in the book, uh, Alternative Approach to Allergies by Randolph. Everybody needs to buy it, memorize it. So he was the father of environmental medicine and he treated Bill Ray for pesticide exposure with his child. Bill Ray lived in a tent outside the house, I think, for years getting better. And then that's why wow. Bill and I are so motivated because no one should go through what Annette and I are going through. Right. Lisa. It's awful. It's awful. And gosh, Dr. Nash, that's awesome. And um, Annette, since you're in Florida, you're not really too far from Martha's Vineyard. I thought you were um, on the West Coast. So, you know, if no, it's I'm, I'm already making the steps and like what happened to um, Dr. Nash and I'm sure other people, this has knocked me out of my life, right? I mean, I was a senior executive, you know, 20 years into biotech startup. I was at the top of my game and just at the, at the time where my impact was the worst, I couldn't get out of bed. I was mm -hmm. completely wiped out. Well, I want to interrupt because I know she wants me to talk about some other stuff as well, but sure. intravenous vitamins every day or every other day for two weeks, you may have done it. Intravenous alpha lipoic acid, very helpful for neurologic disease. Do it. Um, not that many practitioners do it. It's not that hard. And phosphatidylcholine can be helpful, but not so helpful if you've got corona. It's not good. And then um, you need to go and do the allergy testing, oxygen, fix your hormones, see if you have dysautonomia. And if you listen to the rest of the podcast, we may you know, discuss other things. But if you go to, I have a website with free videos. And so you, know, you can learn by reading and watching the videos, and then you don't have to spend so much money on people to tell you stuff. Hey, Dr. Nash, that, what is that website? I was going to say, I just, it's my name. <laughs> it's um, lisanagy.com and you know names may change but so far that's what it is and there's office video one which is clean air food and water like 10 or 15 minutes and then there's office video two is adrenal office video three is dysautonomia and office video four i think i touch on sauna and oxygen and maybe maybe i talked about the allergy testing and i'm supposed to do number five maybe you know this afternoon i'll get inspired to talk about <laughs> coronavirus Yep. Maybe supplements for the immune system. You know, yeah. We're going to get into that. We're going to get into okay. that in the show. So the infrared, infrared sauna treatment, have you been doing that, Annette? Yeah, I, I have. I mean, what I'm hearing is I think it's really time to go to a center where I'm in person to face to face for three months and I can just Heal. rather than just dabble here and there. Yeah. Right, the dabbling I, just, I have there. that care. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm not making any progress. Well, so and if you have you neurologic so disease, if you have neurologic disease like I did, I knew I was going to die and I, I wasn't going to screw around. So you don't care about, I didn't even waste money before I went. Luckily I was saying, you know, a patient called me today and said, I've spent 300,000, which is what I hear all the time. And then they come to me when they're destitute, which is really lovely that I take care of people sometimes for free, but I don't have a big, you know, I'm not into mass production of patients. And if you want to get better, you pick a place. There's Lieberman in South Carolina that he's retiring and he has nice colleagues there. They have a center. I think it's 5,000 a week. There's environmental health center of Dallas. There are people in Buffalo and, you know, various areas around the country that do somewhat daily care. But I'm telling you that if you do sauna and you're not ready, it'll make you worse. Mm. Don't do sauna. If you're sick, don't do anything like that without your doctor. Who's an expert and picking you up after sauna with an IV or oxygen. So you don't get worse. Because you can get very sick within a few saunas if you don't know what you're doing. Because all your yeah. toxins are coming Too out. Too much toxins coming out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like polluting. So Dr. Naj, do you have a center where people actually stay for extended periods of time? I have um, a little bit of housing. I have like four housing. units. You know, I have a couple of places where people can stay that are like Oasis bedroom setups with okay. um, non-toxic paint and 
you know, hard floors. And then the air outside is perfect, right? Yeah. So right close to the ocean. They can go sit at the ocean. And then we do oxygen, IVs, allergy testing, sauna, hormone management, dysautonomia management. And I'm sure, you know, a couple energy treatments that you can do. But I'm really, you know, I'm not in it for the money. And I do take insurance. So oh, it's wow. expensive. You know, you're going to spend between, some people will spend 2000 to come for a couple of days and, and get all that testing done. But then after they're there, you know, they could be there for two to four weeks or eight weeks and maybe spend one to 3000 a week. It mm, depends wow. on if they want to do the IVs. Mm -hmm. So I have a friend going to some spa right now for $5,000 to do ozone, but it's not really about the treatments that we offer and making all the patients do whatever it is we have. It's really about figuring out what that patient would benefit from how much money they have to do it. And then how fast or carefully you need to get in there. Can you do it fast or do you have to do it over six months, you know, and, and, and then just start. And then sometimes people get a lot better within the first three or four days, especially if they're hypoadrenal and you give them Corta. It's like life-changing in 10 minutes. Wow. Very exciting. Um, and that, did that answer your questions or is there anything else you wanted to ask? Oh yes. It answered so, so many. I have much reading and studying to do, but yeah, at least I would love to be put in touch so that I can continue this conversation after the podcast. Okay. Oh, excellent. Yeah. We'll, we'll, um, in the show notes, we'll put, um, Dr. Naja's website and the books that she recommended and all of that. And feel free to reach out to me or Ron directly with any questions. Um, so that was great. Thank you so much for your call. Well, that was really interesting. I know we learned a lot and I'm sure everyone listening did too. We got to be like a fly on the wall of Dr. Naja's office. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Great experience. So thank you, Annette. Appreciate thank you, it. Annette. Well, Dr. Naj, so what effect does our home and toxic exposures from our home have on our immune system? In addition to like what you've already covered. In <laughs> so covered a lot. Well, I mean, what we see specific, I like specifics because it's more interesting than, you know, general terminologies of or descriptions. So what you see in mold patients sometimes is a decrease in the white count to below three or at least below four. That's very common and it takes years to resolve, if ever. The platelet count can drop as well. So you know that the bone marrow is being affected by the, the, the mold toxins. And sometimes it's like benzene, which affects bone marrow. So all the hematologists and oncologists learn that benzene in ink, I had a guy actually in medical school who had aplastic anemia and he sold magazines on the street in New York City, one of those little shacks. And I had a, he was Egyptian and I had to get somebody to come over and give him a bone marrow transplant from Egypt, you know, a relative. And that was my internship. You know, I remember, or maybe it was third year of medicine and, um, you know, medical school. And it was a fascinating case, but now I really see that all the time. I see people who have a failure of their bone marrow due to exposure. And the main thing is, you do enough testing to figure out what the exposure is to get rid of it because if they're in Alabama and it's um, a gasoline station that's got water, the water is contaminated below a gasoline station, let's say, and the benzene and gasoline is affecting the inhabitants and they all get bone marrow failure, but they keep mm -hmm. going back to work, then they'll never get well and they'll die from it. Right. So I just see my grandparents Indiana. actually grew up next to a gas station. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be not, not a good mix there. In for Indiana. The so yeah. we talked yeah. about mold in the home, but what about mold in schools, which is the problem? And this is so interesting, but how is this linked to drug and alcohol use? Not only if you have mold exposure in your home, but in schools as well. Well, I didn't really finish up the immune system very well, but I'll just say that I do do IgG levels and IgM and A, and sometimes you'll see these patients have low IgG. And so that is treated with an IgG injection intramuscularly. And sometimes if they have a bad neurologic disease, a bad polyneuropathy, they can get intravenous gamma globulin at $25,000 a drip at the Whoa. hospital. Yeah, mm -hmm. but paid for by insurance. Oh, wow. And it's curative in some diseases. So there are definitely immune problems with natural killer cells going down. The body won't fight viruses like corona or bacteria like Lyme disease as well when they have mold exposure first. And so that was my big pitch to ILADS, that oh, Lyme group it. years ago. When you think chronic Lyme, think mold first. Ah, interesting. Okay, because they're usually admixed. And now I'm very pleased to say that the ILADS group has like five or 10 mold speakers every year now. And I, wow. I was the first one there. Oh and I gosh. brought Dr. Ray and I talked uh, last year about EMF. And so in schools, 
we're talking about addiction, we're talking about mold, and we should add in EMF, electromagnetic force or frequency. And that's because industrial Wi-Fi in a kid's school and mold exposure, if the roof was leaking, and like on Martha's Vineyard, we have a number of schools that have mold problems. They want to build a $44 million new uh, uh, school, and then they're deciding, oh, they can keep the old one, which is ridiculous. And then the high school here has mold problems. And I see children a lot with a heart rate of 130 or 150, hmm. and it's called dysautonomia from the mold exposure. Dysautonomia. Okay. Yeah, Dis so, I know that's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or POTS is a very common neurologic disease, which this lady could have multiple neurologic problems. You don't just get one in environmental medicine. You know, you're going to find 15 problems if you examine the patient and talk to them. So when you stand up and you're a thin woman, especially, and you fold your arms and you pretzel your legs. That's me. That's I'm, pre I'm pretzeling right now. Yeah. See? And you I know, know, when I oh, first uh, met you, Dr. Naj, you pointed that out. We were standing talking at a conference and you oh said, you're pretzeling your legs. And I was I like, can't believe it. I'm so rude. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, it's, I still think about that, you know, yeah, because but see, the thing is, if you became disabled, then you would have called me or you would have read about dysautonomia. You had a yeah. resource. I right. let you know Right. Yeah. If you had a problem mm -hmm. that you had a clue of what, what was the problem, but mm -hmm. you can pretzel and just go on in life. But if you start getting palpitations and, Oh, I hit the microphone. Sorry. But if you get <laughs> palpitations and you get anxiety, when you release the adrenaline to keep the heart going so fast, that's the problem. So the dysautonomia is very interesting. I think. I oh, just, interesting. Okay. Yeah, so the heart, so a symptom of the dysautonomia is heart palpitations upon yeah. standing up or. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then what, what was the other thing? The heart? Well, the, the blood is going to pool in the legs. The legs will be a little, sometimes reddish or bluish. And it's a neurologic problem from the brainstem and the nerves going down the spinal cord aren't telling the veins in the legs to constrict. So they're dilated, but you don't see it. You don't mm -hmm. see dilation. Mm -hmm. Compression socks treat it in part an abdominal binder, like a back support, Okay, you crank it tight. And that constricts the veins in the gut. Oh, wow. If you, don't, okay. if you don't do that, when you eat a meal, you could fall asleep afterwards. Oh, so that could be a sign. Too. People who get sleepy after they eat. Yeah. That's and a, I used that's to need a sweater. I used to get really cold after I ate for 10 years. And I had uh, a heart rate of 95 when I was in college. We did a bio, you know, some biology study and everybody else had a heart rate of 72 and I had 95. Mm. So I had just started, and I always had a tab. Remember tab? Yeah. Oh I, yeah. The yeah, so diet like drink, the aspartame <laughs> laden. Yeah. So I used to drink tab because it constricted. It had caffeine. It constricted my veins, mm. and I needed a sip. You know, every thirty minutes. Mm -hmm. And now I lecture on dysautonomia from mold mm. exposure. So mold exposure can give you dysautonomia and adrenal insufficiency by damaging the adrenal. And I think I've discovered this. It's in the literature that the two of them coexist in chronic fatigue patients. Oh, okay. I was going to ask you that. So, yeah, yeah, so that would go hand in hand. There's yeah. so much chronic fatigue today, right? I mean, do you yeah, see that? It is. It's the same thing. It's environmental illness. It's environmental it's illness. Disease. No one's getting to the root, right? Like yeah, the so traditional 90 doctor. 90% of them have mold exposure. So, you know, right. you know, a doctor did a study, Brewer, and he studied his chronic fatigue patients, and most of them had mold toxins. Well, that's but really interesting. Wait, so how does mold lead to greater increase in susceptibility to COVID-19 or Corona, theoretically? How does that lead to it? But I didn't really get to do addiction. I'm so yeah, excited we didn't... about addiction. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I, had, I had COVID on the brain, so I apologize. <laughs> okay, so we got six minutes left. No, we have 11 minutes, so yeah, I can yeah. do both. Ready? Okay. okay, ready. Okay, so when you need constriction of your veins and you don't get the drug midadrine to do the constriction, you'll get addicted to caffeine, nicotine, cocaine, or amphetamines. Whoa. When you get, okay? Yeah. Now, when you get dysautonomia, you got to pump out a lot of aldosterone, which is the adrenal hormone to hold on to salt and water and volume so that you don't get dehydrated and you can stay, your heart can stay full. So when your body says, I can't make aldosterone anymore, I'm fried, you burn out the adrenal, you can't make the cortisol or the aldosterone anymore, so you crave sugar because cortisol handles sugar regulation, or you mm. crave alcohol, which is a quick sugar. <laughs> so these people turn into, I'm eating sugar, I'm eating donuts at AA, I'm drinking alcohol, 
and I need vasoconstriction from those stimulants. And then what I figured out is that people with low adrenal function, like real Addison's, they feel really good on heroin and narcotics. Mm -hmm. So they don't know they need steroids. Mm -hmm. They've prescribed hydrocortisone. They just know when they try a narcotic pill for a broken ankle, they Mm -hmm. feel normal. They always say, I feel normal. And heroin makes them feel good when they have Addison's. Is that why there's such a problem with people getting addicted to these medications? Yeah. Like after a surgery, there's really yeah. an underlying issue that has. Oh, you're yeah. <laughs> I'd be your mini assistant. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how I decided to, you know, cause when you look at things with environmental eyes, whether it's, you know, mental issues or stress issues or digestive issues or addiction, there's always an environmental health angle to talk about it. And mm-hmm. this is the way that I thought Liz Warren, for example, would be interested because mm-hmm. she had a $1 billion you know, addiction bill. And so the VA is interested because everybody's addicted to something. But if you could put them on hormones, supplements, and fix them so that they don't have the dysautonomia, give them cons- compression socks, and treat and, and explain these six things make dysautonomia worse. So avoid them. Mm-hmm. When a storm is coming and the barometric pressure drops, you'll feel more tired, like lying in bed. And that's why cows lay down, I think I've discovered. <gasps> oh. oh, yeah. Isn't that exciting? Wow, okay. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and I read about it. And they, and they said, oh, maybe the whatever. But it's because of the venodilation, mm-hmm. you have less pressure on the, on the legs of the cow. So they're like, wow. oh, I'm going to dilate. I want to lay down. Wow. Yeah. Poor and cows. Then, um, the other things that make it worse are a big meal, mm. standing up a long time, mm. heat, exercise, and stores. Going into a store with a high chemical load, like a home improvement store, Mm -hmm. you breathe in the chemicals, Mm -hmm. it affects your nerves, Mm -hmm. your veins dilate, and then I would need a wheelchair to be in in like a Home Depot or something. Oh my goodness. And and in terms of Corona. Yeah. So, because we got to wrap up, but I want to add, we definitely have to have you back. I mean, there's just so much great information. Tell us, since Corona is on everyone's mind right now, and just to kind of sidetrack with just Corona specific, are there over-the-counter supplements that people can do to help prevent viral infections, not just coronavirus, but any viral infection? Yeah, because if you if you say it's effective for Corona, you get arrested apparently. So I'm not going to say <laughs> okay. anything is viral. Specific. Yeah, yeah, it's a crazy thing that uh, some doctor was doing vitamin C drips and mentioned it would help you if you had a viral infection, including Corona, and you know they went after him. So. It's you know, crazy. I'm not that stupid, but I'm seeing it all over. <laughs> I'm seeing it being censored all over the internet, vitamin D and vitamin C, any mention of that. They well, it's just, just totally ridiculous because first of all, there's freedom of speech. And second of all, there are studies. So the studies are out of China that vitamin C intravenously helps in Corona patients, period. There's a study going on in, I want to say North shore, but somewhere on Long Island in New York, New York state that they are doing a, an intravenous vitamin C study. So period, if you get sick and you want to do vitamin C prophylactically, or if you get a little bit sick and the wife of the Cuomo, let's see, Cuomo's brother who is on television got Corona from him. And she went on and did a YouTube video saying that she did one vitamin C drip and did have dramatic improvement. So that's great for her. Yeah. So she's believable. She was a nice person and probably Mm -hmm. he didn't do it. Right. She's the woman. She believed that her integrative doctor should come over and do a drip and she probably had $300 to do it. Not everybody has that, but if it was covered by insurance that people could do IV drips a few times, if they got Mm -hmm. sick, that may help them from going to the hospital. Number two, oral vitamin C is obviously helpful. You know, one or 2000 a day, 4,000 a day, whatever you want to take. Buffered is, is better because it alkalizes you. Mm -hmm. The, those vitamin therapy clinics, they've popped up on every street corner, especially here in California. And to be honest, they're pretty reasonably priced. So just go right. I mean, is that what we're talking about? Just going into the vitamin yeah, C but, clinic and the getting thing is when I do a drip, I'm doing preservative free usually. Mm-hmm. And I'm doing tour. I'm adding taurine and acetal, magnesium and glutathione and, and other things. So that makes the drip more expensive because it's preservative oh. free. You can only open one bottle at a time, you know, gotcha. for a patient. Okay. So you can, you know, you can, I think the drips are 500 in New York. Oh, I'm wow. like 300. Okay. I used to charge 125 bucks, but I realized I was actually losing money on what I'm putting in the drip. Oh, geez. So it depends on what you're putting in, what the price of the drip is, because the vitamin C should be about 15 to 25 grams. But in a sensitive patient, 
you start lower and just one thing, and then you add every 10 minutes or every day, you can add things to make sure that patient is tolerating what you're giving. So it's different for people who quote, think they're totally healthy Mm -hmm. and then just need a little boost. They can probably do anything anywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, And the other things that are useful is there is a vitamin D study. It's obvious that vitamin D has been shown to show a double low vitamin D doubles your mortality, I believe in a study on vitamin D. So everybody should take, I use 50,000 from biotech and you know, it's a doctor purchase thing. You can get regular vitamin D uh, at 5,000 a day. That's what we're taking. Five, Ron and I are taking 5,000 a day. 50,000. Yeah, 50, well, the 50,000 is one every two weeks if you don't know what your level is. Oh, okay. okay. Because it's only $24 for a year and a half. So, you know, I'm a very thrifty half Jewish girl and I like <laughs> a bargain. So I picked, you know, 50,000 in a little teeny capsule because then every other day you could take CoQ10, 600 milligrams and not waste your swallowing of the vitamin D. You know, you only have so many things you want to swallow per day. And then CDP choline is a new supplement that had a great lecture at Great Plains Labs by uh, the director there. And it showed really promising results in people with other coronavirus infections. And it's Mm. used for memory. Mm -hmm. So I bought it from, I think called Carlisle online. It's going to sell out now, but I already bought a thousand dollars worth. So (laughs) it it is uh, like 500 milligrams and you can take 250 to 500 milligrams a day for memory. What is that called again? C D P choline, C H O L I N E. And it helps with memory. But uh, Dr. Shaw was lecturing about how it helps in spider bites, and rattlesnake bites, and multiple sclerosis, and other conditions where there's an inflammatory marker that's released that they used to measure at their lab. And now mm. they're not measuring it this week. It just stopped. But it's called PLA2. And PLA2 goes down when you take CDB choline. So wow. if you get corona, I would be taking it beforehand mm-hmm. and I would definitely add it to your regimen as well as zinc and mm-hmm. colostrum. So I use right. um, zinc. Research. I've heard yeah. you've got to have the zinc, right? But, and then uh, the colostrum is from breast milk and it's in the cow. They put it in a capsule instead of going to the baby cow, it goes to you and it increases your IgG. Mm. So I use, um, there's, what is um, your IgG? Did we, I mean, it, IgG is made by B cells. It's um, antibodies. Okay. So you make antibodies to everything you're exposed to and they fight bacterial infection. Mm, okay. So some people have a low congenital IgG and you need to draw the blood to find out who's walking around with no IgG. They're giving <laughs> IVIG to some of the corona patients. They're giving oh. steroids. Ah, this is where I win the prize, right? They're giving <laughs> Solumedrol to corona patients in ICU with very good results. So that means, are they hypoadrenal patients that happen to get corona? Yeah, probably. Okay. So you don't want to be hypoadrenal and walking around in society. Those are the ones who are going to die. Oh, wow. Any virus with influenza. Mm -hmm. Who gets, when, when you're hypoadrenal, you go into shock, you drop your blood pressure. When you get a viral infection or a bacterial infection, you have trauma. So all my patients have a bracelet. I have Addison's. Give me hydrocortisone, 100 milligrams. So if you have corona and you take oral steroids at a low dose, maybe hydrocortisone and not prednisone, maybe prednisone, I don't know. Maybe that will save you from hospitalization Mm. two days later. Yeah. Anyway, I'll end on that note. We're going to, yeah, this is so great. I I don't want to end this conversation. We could go on and on. I mean, I guess really the, the underlying thought here, if we could sum it up, I would say, from based on what you've said is be proactive with your health and get these things tested and then see an environmental MD because you could be getting these illnesses and never getting to the root of what is causing them, right? So at the end of the day, take proactive approach with your health. Don't wait till you're sick and then go look for the quick fix, which is what the majority of people do. Yeah, we all try to get by. I mean, even I tell my patients that they can't have wine but tequila is pretty good for people because they're not allergic to cactus. So I'm a practical person that people want to have fun. They want to enjoy their <laughs> You're life. You're the fun doctor. Right? You're well, the fun doctor. Saying, She's you know, the tequila the, doctor. Well, and also the men who are with the women, they will engage if you talk about, you know, sexual activity, that it's going to get better. Your wife's going to be fun. Try oxytocin. Try testosterone if it's low. If you engage that man and he gets something beneficial out of, his participation in his wife's health, 
They both <laughs> sail off into the sunset in a happy You're way. You're saying bribe them. Wait, liquor I feel and like I'm part of a private and, conversation. Liquor and <laughs> I hear it. I hear the message oh. here. <laughs> Real quick. So oral vi- uh, vitamin C. What is the threshold? You said 4,000. You know, I've heard you can't take more than 2,000, 3,000. It's real quick. I, what, what's your thought on that? As well, far as if you get diarrhea it? from vitamin C, it's too much because orally, you can't take more than one, two or 3,000, 4,000 at a time. Mm-hmm. So if you want to tolerate more per day because you've got a virus, you got to space it out every okay. two to four hours. Yeah. And then you, okay. can take a, you can take 1,000 every two hours okay. if you can't take 2,000. Mm-hmm. And you could take, you know, easily people take 8,000 a day if they're sick. I don't have the energy to do it, but it depends if it's buffered and whether it'll give you diarrhea. And if you're also taking magnesium, which I recommend like magnesium glycinite or or if you get diarrhea from that magnesium orotate. And then there's tri salts and that's for raising the salt level. So all of those things lead to loose stool. So if you're okay. taking things that give you loose stool, you can't take them all and then go do anything. Yeah. Is that why the IV, the the IV vitamin C, you can take higher doses. You're not going to have yeah. any of those gastrointestinal. It's not in the gut and it doesn't give you diarrhea at all. Oh, okay. I think we'll end on that note. <laughs> <laughs> no diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. This was so amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Naj. I mean, this was just a wealth. You're such a wealth of knowledge. And listeners, thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed today's show as much as we did. And do not forget to tune in next week to find out what the hack is going on in your home. This episode of the Healthy Home Hacks podcast has ended, but be sure to subscribe for more healthy living strategies and tactics to help you create the healthy home you've always dreamed of. And don't forget to rate and review so we can continue to bring you the best content. See you on the next episode.